when asked what he would do about the Israeli-Pakistani conflict, the famous Israeli author responded in only the way an author can respond, that if he could do anything, he would change the arc of the narrative from one that follows the narrative of Shakespearean tragedy, and he would change it to a narrative that follows the arc of a Chekhovian tragedy. And what he meant by that was simply, a Shakespeare's tragedy is tragic because at the end of the play, invariably, everyone has their swords drawn and they stick it into themselves or someone else and everyone's dead. It's tragic. In a Chekhovian tragedy, everyone, metaphorically, has their swords drawn, ready to kill each other, and there's a revelation that comes over their mind that they are stuck being a human. And by being stuck as a human, there are some irreconcilable differences we may have that we can never overcome, and that's tragic. And at that revelation, the swords drop, and everyone just feels depressed. <laughs> Similarly, 1981, I'm not a Polish historian, but there's a, a story I'd like to tell you. 81, uh, the Polish militia started to shoot into a crowd that was peacefully gathering in um, support of the Solidarity Movement. There was a, a riot broke out, the militia shot into the crowd, killing many, injuring hundreds. It also ushered in a time in Polish history of martial law. Henryk Goreski, famous Polish composer, did what only a composer did, and he honored that event by writing a, a piece. But because Goreski was a supporter of the Solidarity Movement, and because of the political situation in Poland, Goreski couldn't perform his piece until six years later in 1987. Between 1981, when he wrote the piece, and 1987, another thing happened in Poland, and that was there was a priest who was a sympathizer with the Solidarity Movement, and he was assassinated by the Polish government. So when Goreski decided to perform his piece that he wrote honoring the 1981 events, he decided to premiere it in the chapel that used to be the congregation of the priest that was assassinated by the Polish government. You can imagine the tension. 1987, six years after martial law in Polish, Poland, a composer who was sympathetic to the Solidarity Movement, writing a piece to honor the deaths of people who died at the hands of the Polish government in the church of a priest that was assassinated by the Polish government for his beliefs, his political beliefs. This was a tense moment. No one knew what Goreski did. What he did was he wrote a 35-minute piece, a cappella, 150-piece, and if you've ever heard a 150-piece a cappella chorus, it's extremely moving. And there they were, people, all ready to hear what Goreski, one of the most famous contemporary composers in Poland, what he did to honor this event in 1981. And what he did was extraordinary. And that was for 34 minutes. There was, yeah, two words sung over and over and over. And Acapello says, dear Lord, dear Lord, dear Lord, dear Lord. And the resolution, there was no harmonic resolution, but the resolution of the phrase he ended with, dear Lord, Please forgive us. Another extraordinary story, and one I've always wanted to share, so thanks for letting me share those two stories. We'll get back to them later. Well, my name's Joe, and I sell tea. Um, admittedly, it's a little strange telling a group of people what I do for two reasons. One is whenever I come in, a middle-aged, overweight, white guy in the Midwest, and say I sell tea, people's eyes glaze over, and they, have, they can't understand what I'm saying. For instance, two months ago, I went down to North Carolina to give a presentation on tea, and I was stopped at the security gate, and they asked me what I was doing, what I did with my life, and I responded, I sell tea. And the security agent, he looked at me. He, just, he looked at me, and I could tell what was going through his mind. And I said, I sell tea. And he goes, tea? I said, tea. He said, tea? And I go, T-E-A, I sell tea. You drink it. And finally he said, oh, tea, you sell tea. You know, it's, it, moments like that, I wish coffee captivated me in some way. The other reason I'm always apprehensive, appreh apprehensive to tell people what I do is because when I say tea, I almost always mean something completely different than what everyone else thinks I'm talking about. I do not sell herbs. I do not fl sell flowers. I do not sell spice blends. I sell a plant that's hand-picked, hand-rolled, and has a history that goes back 5,000 years. The oldest cultivated plant known to man, and I sell it in the way that it was being drunk 5,000 years ago, and that's really important to me, and that's what I sell. I actually go to India and China and work with seven of the most famous villages directly so that I could bring the tea over and I can give you an experience that somehow I believe connects you to you being a human. 
Um, and my talk really isn't about the business. My talk is really about how I stumbled upon tea. And that starts with, I've got to give you some trivial facts to get you to where I am today standing on a stage. And that starts when I was five years old. And one of the things that I don't often talk about, but it's an important story, is that I suffered a lot of abuse as a kid. Sexual abuse, emotional abuse. That on its face isn't so important, but what's important is that I had lived with those experiences thinking that I never really had any effects from that. I was a well-adjusted kid, so I thought. I went on, went to college, but as I started getting older, I started seeing this, a repetition in my life. There was a pattern that started, and that pattern was travel. And I didn't understand, I just, I would travel, and it wasn't that I was traveling, it was I was traveling to extreme places. All through Africa, Central Asia, Siberia, all through Southeast Asia, Asia, Central America, if there was a remote place, I was headed there. And invariably, I'd get back home and people would ask me, oh, that's interesting, you were in Ethiopia for the last seven months, uh, why? And you start creating, or I started creating a mythology of why I was traveling. Of course, at the time, I didn't realize that it might have something to do with what happened to me as a five-year-old. I started creating a myth that I was discovering something about cultures and people through food and drink. And it seemed right, because everywhere I went, I loved drinking and I loved eating. And so this myth, the more I traveled and the more I talked about my interests in traveling, the more I started to believe this. And the more I started to eat, the more I started to drink. And pretty soon, I had a nice checklist, especially with alcohol. I had a checklist of all the famous vineyards, all the famous growing areas. We would go out to seven times in two years. I went out to Northern California and started meeting winemakers. Ended up at Cornell in a certified distiller. Uh, went out to Washington State University to learn how to make hard cider from one of the preeminent hard cider makers in England. And through this time last 15 years, when I wasn't overseas, I was living in Detroit. And if you've been paying attention to what's happened in Detroit, especially since 1997, is there's this movement, this entrepreneur movement that's happening down in the city, and I was part of that. I was kind of uh, keyed into what was happening, and I too wanted to be a part of it. And of course, naturally for me, with my travels, I started to say, wow, I can engage in my community and be a part of my community, and I can introduce crafted alcohol. And this gives you an idea of how delusional I was being with myself. I mean, of all the things a city like Detroit or all Southeast Michigan, the one thing they know very well is drugs and alcohol. I mean, we have a history of abuse. And here I was, I thought I was gonna help my community by opening the first distillery in the city of Detroit. Fortunately, two people have done it, so I don't have to do it anymore. But my mind, I was confused at what it really meant to engage in a community. Here I was, I was going to push an alcohol, a drug on people to try to strengthen the community. And for years, people kept on asking, Joe, when are you going to start this, the cidery? When are you going to do the distillery? And I kept on saying, we're, we're planning, we're going to do it, we're going to do it. And for some reason, it never felt right. And I never really followed through. And I was getting frustrated. I said, man, why can all these other people start a business and I can't? So finally, my journey as it was going through the world in this kind of crazy path, all of a sudden, my journey took a, a right turn. And I took a fellowship to teach at a university in Western China. Western China is not the China that you see on CNN, CNBC. It is not the land of high rises. It's the world's second largest shifting sand desert, the Takumakan, which is named by the Mongols for the, those who enter will not return, surrounded by the three largest mountain ranges, Himalayas in the, in the south, the Pamirs on the west, and the Altai Mountains in the north. This is extreme. It's further from water than anywhere else in the world. And as a, at this time, this was back in 2000, I was still in my 20s, still very naive and green, still a political activist, very much interested in political doings. Not only did I land in the desert, but I landed in a 2,000-year-old dispute between the Turkic group, the Uyghurs, and the Chinese. And if you remember in 2000, it's before 9-11. It's before the Chinese government and the U.S. government got in bed about central intelligence of Central Asia. So at this time, 2000, the Uyghurs still look to America as being the great hope of their liberation as they watch their literal cousins in Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan get their independence from the Soviet Union. So I got a fellowship. For me, my fellowship comes through an institution called Princeton University. 
And if you know anything about Princeton University and the history of Princeton University, there's a lot of people funneled through that university in intelligence. I had quit a job that I was working in the auto industry, making decent money to take a job making $150 a month through an organization that for over 200 years was supplying most of the intelligence with the CIA in one of the hottest areas of the world. That's five times bigger than Texas, and only 100 people, 100 foreigners at the time, were living there. And I got off the plane, I was ready to experience the world, and I looked around and it was exciting, it was really exciting. Pakistani arms dealers, uh, talks with the Taliban, and I, I wasn't asking questions why these people were seeking me out, and talking to me and giving me information. This was extraordinary for me. But the problem, and what I didn't realize was going to happen, is that the extreme landscape just south of Siberia has extremely cold winters. And December came, January came, and all of a sudden, minus 30, minus 40, and it was black, dark, and dirty. And the context and the excitement that I felt, uh, felt when I got there in the spring and the summertime, it started to go away, and I, I, lost, I, I lost a compass. I had no idea who I was talking to, why I was talking to them, and I got really scared. So take a step back and pull the... Uh, I, I can reveal to you, now that I've looked back on my life and understa understand why I was traveling, the abuse created incredible anxiety in me. Not anxiousness, but an anxiety, and the anxiety, psychological anxiety, my inability to be focused in the present. My mind was constantly looking at the past or in the future, and it created a lot of tension. The travel, especially to extreme places, was creating kind of a placid moment in my mind because it was so extreme that I had to focus on learning a language, figuring out how to get food, figuring out how to get a bed to stay at. So it was a drug, it was a narcotic, and over time, Alcohol became the same, same drug for me, right? One thing we don't talk about as much as I still, I mean, I'm not a, a teetotaler. I do still drink alcohol, but what I started realizing for myself is that you know, alcoholism comes in a lot of different forms. And for me, because I was making a lot of money at different jobs, as my resume got better and better and better, I was just able to start you know, my binge drinking in extravagant places, and I could intellectualize it. And I can say, well, you know, I'm an intellectual, and I know all these regions, and I have 50 bottles of wine, and let's, let's share them together. Let's drink a few tonight. And because I could intellectualize this binge drinking, I didn't see myself as the man in the corner with a paper bag. You know, that's, that's a different class of person. That's not me, the sophisticated world traveler who knows so much about alcohol. The problem for me, though, is the money was creating a delusion in my head. So here I am, back in Xinjiang province, western China. Dark days, cold, and I got scared. And I, I mean, there was no one to go to. And so I had to figure out quickly a way to really kind of relax myself. And it was just by mistake. There's two people that I found. One were the carpet vendors, Central Asian beautiful carpets, and the other one was the tea vendors. Another coincidence of history is that the tea vendors in Western China were the Taiwanese tea vendors. And that's important for historical reasons, no time for this talk. But the Taiwanese uh, tea merchants, the other thing that was I'm so lucky for is that they could speak about tea in an intellectual level, a level that really captivated me in the same ways when you look at marketing for wine or marketing for the new craft beer movement that connected me to culture, to humanity, to design, to craft. And they knew these stories, and they started to share these stories. And so I started getting lost in the history and the culture of tea in the middle of the desert. And I was captivated. Then they told me two, two stories that, that were essentially, this is why I'm able to talk the way I am about my past and have an understanding. The first thing they shared with me are the metaphors associated with the traditional Chinese tea ceremony. And I usually do this for a smaller group, so when I'm talking these metaphors, I'm going to hold my hands up. Sorry if I'm doing that. It's the way I, it's easiest for me to see this story. When you brew tea, you have a vessel. You put your tea leaves in that vessel, and you pour warm water on the tea leaves to steep them. Simple. Now, the metaphor that he explained to me, that pot was referred to as the mother pot. And it's referred to the mother pot because in that process of steeping tea, you take two disparate elements, the tea leaf and the hot water, you combine them, and he said, to make life. Just like a mother takes sperm and, a, uh, and an egg to create life herself. So it's the mother. 
why life? So you look historically, the last five, 6,000 years, as people were drinking tea, it's extremely important in an agrarian society to have tea. You needed to boil your water, and you needed the tea to give you your essential vitamins and minerals. A cup of tea, a handful of rice, you could live forever until your heart says no more. So in a very literal way, these gentlemen were explaining to me that liquid in that bowl was their life, just like the mother creates you through these two elements. So then the mother takes that tea and pours it into another vessel, essentially a pitcher, through a filter. And he explained to me that the mother then feeds the son. The mother takes her wisdom, her learning, her background, her past, her experiences, and she makes something only she can make. And she distills that into something unique, creative, and she literally filters that to the sun, the pitcher, the sun pot. And that sun pot, once he's nurtured, once he's filled with the wisdom and the love from his mother, the sun can go around and feed his community. And that pitcher is then used to fill up the cups of everyone who's enjoying the tea together. First metaphor. Second metaphor. When you're doing a tea ceremony, psychologically, the Chinese understand that there's always a reason for the ceremony. Either you're going to meet with your family, your friends, business associates, and there's, everyone wants to get to the table and talk. They have something to share, or you want to taste the tea, and that creates a lot of anxiety. Everyone's there, anxious, let's get to it, let's taste this tea, let's talk. And so this anxiety, everyone's quick, everyone's not in the moment. So you dr drink your first two rounds quickly. Everyone talks, everyone shares what they need to share. The third round, they then pour warm, hot water, plain water, no tea. Why? Because that's for you, in your mind, to realize the importance of what's happening. Not only are you drinking tea, which remember is life, or drinking this warm water, which is essential for your living, but you're sharing it with people who mean something to you, your friends, your families, your business associates. And I have a suspicion that everyone in this room, whether you drink tea all the time, never, sometimes, has something in you that understands tea is something you share with someone else. It's very uncomfortable for people to drive through a local coffee shop and order a paper cup of tea and go away. There's a pull, there's an impulse to want to share that. There's a warmth to tea. These two metaphors stung me, and I realized finally why I was traveling. In one way, I was traveling to hear these stories because it shared with me what I was missing. That love from that pot to that sun, that's what was missing. That was destroyed and taken from me when I was abused as a kid. And that took me on that, <laughs> sorry, it's emotional. That took me on the journey. And this delusion, this, this desire and this need and this, this want to help my community in Detroit through alcohol, through, <laughs> through further poisoning that city, it occurred to me, you know, that I, in being delusional with myself and who I, who I was as a person, the reason I was never comfortable with any of those ideas that I had along the way was because I knew intimately that I could not develop a community and I could not create a community by giving them a drug. As soon as I had made those, those recollections is when I said, that's it. It's tea. That's what I do now. I sell tea. So I go back to Amos Oz and Henrik Gorecki and why those spoke so much to me. I used to love sharing those stories. They were big party favorites. I could share these beautiful, big, grand uh, proclamations and people say, oh, you're so smart, Joe. But really what was speaking to me wasn't the political backdrop of each. That's the noise, that gets in the way. What they were sharing with me was that discovery I was waiting for all along, and that's the simplicity of the discovery. It's the simplicity and the reminder of being human, of finally letting go. And that's the point of me standing on this stage. It's because I believe, and here's, I, sh I should trademark this. My saying when I started this company was that coffee is the drink of the revolutionary. He is the drink of family and friends. And all of you, from being here to TEDx talk, you're all on a revolution. Personal revolution, social revolution, whatever it is. You're here for a reason. You have a point of view. You want to get that across, but that's extremely tiring to always be in a revolution. And I want to plant the seed that there's going to be some moment in your life in the next day, in the next two days, in the next year, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 
when you're going to feel exhausted and you're going to say, I'm tired, I'm tired of this revolution. And there's something dusty in the back cupboards. It's got a word, it says tea. And I want to plant the seed that when you get tired and you're ready to stop the revolution or you need to take a moment, you want to kind of reassess what's happening. I want to plant the seed and remind you that a simple thing like a cup of tea can give you the break and the breath that you need. So thank you.